Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle, bitch. Check it, check it, check it. It's unique hustle. It's your boy, ECEO man, and I'm in the building down here in New Orleans with my boy, OG Pyru. Ayatollah Marvin's in the building. We in the building. We in New Orleans, man. In New Orleans. Listen, we with a guy that been on the show before, man. He done blessed my game a couple of times. The first time he was down here, then he flew up to Dallas. He came a second time. My boy Kunta is in the building. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you for coming back on Boss Talk 101. Man, I just want to say, man, you know, it's just every time, you know, I get to sit down with you, man, and just knowing the agenda that you was pushing when I first met you, to see you still pushing the That's same the agenda game, like game, i know you guys just getting into it a little bit like you guys y'all they, they they let y'all go because they say they found out that you guys didn't do it well basically they didn't uh just let us go uh they had Speak a couple right, of right into that mic. a couple of documents for as a federal white there you go there that, you go that nature that kind of uh freed us up uh they was literally trying to force a deal even in that situation and uh we gracefully declined. You know, even after knowing that we was innocent of the charges, it was still stringing it on and trying to offer a deal. You know, uh, like I said, we declined. I'm gonna continue this fight. We own it. Yeah, it's yeah. Very tough, bro. Now, last time I thought, let me put that back right there. Last yeah. time I thought, like, man, like they had already, they were gonna settle up with y'all and everything gonna run smooth. Have you ran into some bumps and bruises? Uh, Plenty of them. I mean, like I said, this is probably one of the biggest cases to actually happen in this case, in, in this in this state, literally, in a minute, since Kim Groves, which is, you know, somebody else that was a victim inside of this case, um, dealing with the officer, Lynn Davis. Uh, for those who don't know what Lynn Davis is, he's the most Kunta, notorious. Can, for a novice, can you start off and tell us what happened? I mean, how... Okay. Can you give us a briefing? Because, you know, I don't, I'm from right. Compton indeed. and we don't even get a indeed. newspaper out okay. there. Okay, <laughs> indeed. I feel what you're um, you know what I'm saying? I've been reaching out to our way too, indeed. So uh, what happened was uh, me and two of my childhood friends, I'm Kunta Gable. I have uh, two co-defendants previously was arrested with me, um, Bernal Salute and Leroy Nelson. Uh, all three of us is out of the neighborhood, which is currently down the street, Iverfield Housing Projects. Okay, uh, during the years of 1993, 94, the city was like, you know, the murder capital at the time. We had a lot of crime. It was just outrageous down here. The cops were responsible for most of the crime that was taking place. Yes, sir. But we didn't have the resources to prove this at this time. Uh, uh, they had a murder that took place in a desire housing project, which is the night war. Okay. Uh, during the proceedings of this murder, we in an altercation in the Iverfield Housing Projects uh, with a couple of childhood friends at an event. Um, while they, in the proceedings of the murder taking place in the Desire, we was called in over the radio for being involved in that crime when we was actually involved in something in another neighborhood five and a half miles away. We got stopped in a traffic stop. While we was on the vehicle, we could hear Officer Lynn Davis screaming over the radio about the vehicle that we was in was the target vehicle that just left the Desire Housing Project five and a half miles away and assassinated somebody. Uh, the victim, Rondell Sandinac, a guy who we never seen in our lives. So uh, th this shit was literally on light tap. That's the thing that had me disturbed. This shit, the feds had them under Operation Shadow Shield since 1993 of November. Had the police under? Yes, yeah, had the city. It was called Operation Shadow Shield. It was an investigation set up. Right, okay. It was called Operation Shadow Shield. And it was after all crooked cops. So they had uh, wiretaps on several cops. They had gave several cops tap phones, tap pages, tap their vehicles and things that was in this certain rank they had going on. Uh, Lynn Davis was supposedly the head rank leader of it. Uh, that's the guy that actually uh, did the trans communications and actually gave us a charge for somebody we never seen in our lives. Mm. So uh, set for 28 and a half years, right at wow. 28 and a half years wow. for a guy I still haven't seen a day. I mean, they don't have enough decency to show us a picture of this guy. Oh, the guy, yeah. I haven't seen this guy 
in the fashion of a fall. Man, and and, and I, it's just so critical when, yes. when I hear you talking the emotion yes. about doing 28 years. I did 25 years, but I did everything they said I did. Indeed. And I was still heard about Indeed. it. So you I can understand yes. a man going to prison and, and other than a peck of wood, if that had been him wrongfully, he would have committed suicide inside, inside that day. That day. Indeed. Wow. It, Indeed. It, it's such a difference, seen the, the strength mm -hmm. that this brother didn't endure. How old was you when you went to prison? When in 17, I was 17, 17 years old. 17. And you go, and see, he, did, he, he didn't grow up in a California prison where he had a cell. He was in something where, I mean, they make sissies out of boys down here. Allegedly. Yeah. I, I hear nothing. Super facts. So I'm just saying this, I, I tell you, I, I, I was I was in Huntsville and I knew that was a man's man. Nigga, you gonna fight or die. Indeed. You dig what I'm saying? And, and and the buff I had because they was impressed with San Quentin. I wasn't. You dig what I'm saying? Indeed. I was impressed them niggas picking cotton. Wow. You understand me? Anytime you pick, if you ever picks up some cotton, and how soft it is, and you have to pick up 250 mm -hmm. pounds a day. They have these dudes, and after you do, they say five years in Huntsville, your fingerprints go away. They have to do your toe prints. So when he saw, talks about being in prison and surviving prison innocently, and ain't killed every crocodile. I could, he, need, he need a Nobel Prize. Man, what you say? Mm. He need, he, I would have been killing the warden. Well, what I, say, uh, <laughs> what I would say to that is, I was listening to the previous you know, interview where uh, y'all spoke out on the difference between the prisons out here in, in San and Quentin. West, yes, uh, the mental thing is the biggest part of it. Mm -hmm. The thing about Angola is you have the option. That's the biggest mental game that comes with it. You have the option to catch that cell and not work. Mm. You go in that cell and you can stay there till the cell break you. Mm -hmm. or you can come out and work. You see what I'm saying? And that's the way they navigate the whole system. So you know me when I first went in, I mean, for no reason, no reason would I work for anybody under no circumstance. I wasn't working in that prison, period. Okay. I didn't come to jail to get a job, period. Right, could have gotten so one on the street. Yes, I didn't come to jail to get a job. I'm not supposed to be in here. So I rebelled as much as I could. It was a different effect for me because my government name is Clunto. So literally. Wow. My, yes, to get caught up in that situation and knowing that my mom's had, you know, this is not a fairy tale or something that I'm dragging. She literally instilled and told me the same thing, brother, but just saying. They gonna run you down. Just stand up. Mm. White man gonna run you down. Stand up. And the whole time while I'm in that prison, all I can see is that Roots movie. Mm. I can see myself. I can see that guy. I read the book uh, from every aspect to me, even knowing that it's all a facade. Mm. You know. So uh, with that being said, bro, I had to break myself down over and over mentally to handle the situation I was in. So I had to play a mind game with myself to come out themselves, give myself a breather. You know, so that led to the work. When I come to the work, then I ask myself, I say, well, okay, just think about the world, Slim. Everywhere in the world, everywhere, not just in the United States, in the world, in the places that it's supposed to be, the earth is manicured. It's gonna be manicured. The grass is gonna be cut. If not, you do not pass any places where you see Shit just so outrageous, it's covering houses, it's growing the grasses out. So it's already ordained and in place that it's gonna get done, whether you do it or somebody else do it. It's gonna get done all over the earth. This is not slavery, it's a slavery because they put you in this state of this system that they have. But if this wasn't a jailhouse, this damn 18,000 acres would be getting cut either way because God demands that. So that was the psychological thing that I had wow. to give myself to say, bro, listen, either way it go. Right now, I find myself at my own house. If you see my grass at this very moment, bro, I'll slap the shit out of me. Be like, like, hell, you just come from me. But I'm just so, you know, I just love it. I want to see it grow because I can. I don't want to cut it. 
You know what I'm saying? I want to see this shit grow and I'll cut it when it's time. But it was a crazy psychological mm. effect that I had to go wow. through this cook on that plantation. Bro. Wow. He had to go through it. You had to go through it just trying to understand how to grasp even the situation after you got in it. Like, I can't mentally grasp this and even deal Man. with it. How, how much, how much, how many issues did that cause you with the guards? Oh, I'm talking about uh, any guy that been to that prison since the time I arrived. They'll tell you from the Hey, Warden, on down. They all know me for the same thing. Any security guards you talk to in the prison, they all know me for the same thing. They all gonna speak the same thing about me because I never was, you know, a closet person. Yeah. Whatever I did in the prison, that's what I was doing. I am not changing it. Send me where you're gonna send me. I get high, I jack, I strong on. My life was on the line 24 7. Wow. My whole 28 years. Ain't got nobody been an Angola, ain't gonna say that. Every day of his jokes, he could have died from the way he was living in there. But it's just because I wasn't supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't want nobody to tell me to do shit. So you didn't play with nobody so when it came went, to you? I, I didn't have time to play. I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to. And I knew my situation by me being strategically set up. This is different from another guy that's actually falsely accused. There's different levels to being arrested. So it don't make sense for me to hit the law library every day like my guy who just walked off. That's Big my bro. main man in the prison. Me and him did our whole jokes together. Wow. And he used to beg me to come in to the library with him. Man, what you doing? Come on, come on, come on. 2001, I seen one thing that I needed to identify with, with the law. And that was the Under the Color of Law Act. There was nobody in Angola even speaking on that or even teaching that from that angle because we wasn't dealing with federal cases. Mm-hmm. But it identified with my whole situation, and I just kept stressing that to my I guy. Come over Thor. Everybody, yes, yes, sir. yes, yes, sir. And I left the library from that day in 2001, and I always told him that's how I'm going home under the color of law. Like, Man, you gotta know. I got this right here. This is what I'm gonna prove, and that's how I come on, bro. That's what's how, civil what civil right how, now. How did, we was exonerated. They found wiretaps that actually. So you you filed a writ of mandamus. Yes. Or, uh, all right. Uh, this was happened. Okay. Uh, I had an attorney representing me. Right. This attorney that was representing me right now, which is Mrs. Julia Tizar, she was one of the most prestigious district attorneys in this state. Right. Okay. In this city, for sure. With her stats, she was under the Harrick Connick administration, which was the worst administration to actually navigate or run in this city for like a 37 year period, race period, right? Okay, she converted over from being a district attorney and became a defense lawyer. Okay. The woman took my case and knowing that she actually filed against us in appeal, right? You feel me? You she filed me? against you. Yes, yeah, she was actually assistant district attorney. Okay. She filed against us in appeal. She was actually involved with, with the case. case. So it's a major conflict of interest off top for her to convert over to be a defense lawyer and take my case, knowing that she previously had dealings with my case as a defense attorney. I mean, as, as a, a district prosecutor. attorney. Yes. Held my case for seven years. In prison, there's seven extra years I did. I couldn't get no other legal representation or nothing. She knew it was a conflict of interest and just took the money. But she never filed nothing into court because she knew she couldn't. She would lose her license. So she prevented me all those years, seven and a half years, from getting any type of legal system because she was my representation. Okay. Juvenile parole eligibility comes around for us in this state in 2017, 2018. That gives me access to juvenile parole. Okay, they appoint me a juvenile attorney. The attorney that gets on the case, tell me you're you handling this, that, and the other. And he said, I have something I want to share with you. Do you know the attorney that you currently have was the same district attorney that was actually involved in your case of filing against him? Like, no, you I didn't said, know that? No. Wow, I that's said, crazy. This is why. She was always asking me where I'm getting this information from, telling me about getting GD and trying to sneak me out through parole because she didn't want to go a file knowing that she wasn't even supposed to have my case. He exposed it, took the case from her. Right now, I'm dealing with her in that situation, but we also have something in the civil court. Wow. So how, 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 did, how did she, how did you, you, you asked for her? Man, listen, no. 
somebody fishtailed her to me. Uh -huh. Some kind of way I actually, if you ask me, and I, I know better than to assume. You know what I'm saying? But I will say she is, she tied to this case some kind of way. Wow. Yeah, she's literally some kind of way she know the backdrop to yeah, she do. prison, being in prison and everything, yeah. bro. Because there's no way she was supposed to sit there seven and a half years, block me off. She was like, she was holding my case, hoping that I die. Right, right. I'm the only one kept egging and egging and egging, putting this information out, and she was holding it. Now the juvenile lawyer come along, filed it. That man got me out in two and a half years, bro. I, I'm talking about I could have been out before that. I was turning down deals. They was offering me deal. Why are you going to offer me a deal when you're looking at my? It's impossible. Right, yes. right. So, so we fought it. And those guys that were with you, they just basically, because of the way that you were handling your part of it, they were able to be released as well, right? And, or right. Were, they were, because were they we fighting or were they all, doing anything? Yes, we all, we all fought. Were y'all talking or communicating through letters? We had plenty of communication, but the thing is, is with that, you know, the time factor, the timelines and the lawyer's separations once the appeal comes, so we all in court in different times. Yeah. And now that we getting our own attorneys, they, you know, trying to severance, or I'm representing him or I just represent my client, you know what all I'm right. saying? And then they leave the evidence in the case that they know is false against all of us, but you steady fighting for just your client and right. try to right. shift. So it always been us in a shift role because nobody wanted to take the case and represent all three of us. So as mm -hmm. soon as it came around for the juvenile process, when we was like literally bought out of court, we were sent and we supposed to be doing a natural life sentence. No way back in court, period. We was dead on that bogus juice. And if it wasn't for me and my youngest co-defendant being juveniles and that juvenile parole eligibility wind up coming around full circle, which is God bless him. Yeah. And that's how I found who, who, who was the attorney that I represented you for the juvenile. Josh Schwartz, attorney Josh Schwartz for parole uh, project. Awesome guy, bro. Awesome. I never let him get away from me. You know, uh, right now, I think they're kind of angry with him because of the way I'm handling this case. OK, uh, a lot of things that I'm exposing every chance I get. It kind of rattles the head district attorney, which I appreciate the fact that he uh, did his job. But they, they, they promote it as if you did us a favor. You didn't do me no favors by cutting us loose. That's right. That's no right. favors. So why would you ask me to be lenient towards the, the state? No. Yeah. That's that, that's and that and you know, uh, Miss Julie, she been threatening me and everything. I got it. The lawyers talking about if I keep putting her name out there, she, I'm gonna wind up in jail or worse. And, you know, wow. Yes, this this is this, a and, and, and you know that's what we were talking about yes. earlier. And, and and it always kills me about the Negro psychic. Mm -hmm. uh, he's talking about uh, a, a white woman. I can say white woman. Okay. okay. Well, a white woman. I think she is a white Indeed. woman. Indeed, that knew this. She knows something about this. She ended up to her fucking neck. And she need that she all the way, but she's never taking responsibility saying I fucked over you, bro. Yes, oh, I wasn't yes, supposed to say so that. Right. But and people tell me all the time, well, well, bloods, oh, we killing each other. Shouldn't we take responsibilities? Why they never took responsibility for hanging us? Our responsibility for bringing us over here. They tell you to get over it. Get up by your bootstraps. You ain't got no damn boots. You know wow. what I'm saying? Wow. So when you look at something like this, and here this brother went through 28 years or something. Eight and a half. And a half. You gotta say that half. You gotta say that half. And these crackers still ain't gave him a holiday. Man, you know, and, won't you, and don't want to. Disrespectful, wanna, very disrespectful. That's, you know, I mean, yeah. if every black ain't raw, oh, well, you know, he did something. Who cares? Yes, yes, indeed. Like, I, that's what we say. That's that's the dynamics that kill me about yes. us. Yeah. Now, if it come to Trump and it's 34 counts, yes, well, you know, that's that's the Trump, system. Yeah, that's the way they work. You know, but when it comes to one of, like I say, bro, I commend him. 
Yeah. Every crime they said I did, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some more they didn't and say I did. did. You hear yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And my mama was the only one naive. Yeah, 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 mama, yeah. mama, did you do it? <laughs> I, I just wouldn't answer. I, I wasn't going to break my mama heart. You, you yeah. get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and I was mad. So I'm like him. I, I could have changed Kotex machines or baby di- I don't work in prison. I go to the hole so they can protect me. That's the safest yeah. place in the prison. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere I go, I'm escorted. Mm-hmm. They bring the food to mm-hmm. my cell. I'm in the safest, and if they get out of line, I'm flooding my cell. Yes. I'm throwing piss and shit on them. I make your job hard. Right. You dig what I'm saying? Wow, man. Because that's, that's the good. resentment yes. that I had for being there. Yeah, and, and a man told me along the, it, growing up, and I was in San Quentin in '22. I got caught. Uh, was in, involved in a, a a riot in Youth Authority. I went to Youth Authority on a murder robbery, and was 28 days to the house, Indeed. and listened to somebody else, and got involved, and was mad about it. Mm-hmm. And, and and I I went to prison, man. And I used to I remember every. It, one, uh, one of the out of your New Orleans boys, uh, yeah. Joe Louis Sturgis, who was in San Quentin, he said, boy, I'm looking at you niggas here in San Quentin. He said, I thought Compton was big as China. Yeah. All y'all in here for murder, 250 of y'all? Damn. Man, and y'all ain't but 10 square miles. Yeah. And they had this old man named Shithouse Shorty, 1974. Yeah. He said, boy, anybody like this like need shit thrown in their face. Straight like that. Right straight. I woke up one morning in Ironwood State Prison, 1994. When I went to prison, I was young Mohawk. Mm-hmm. Now they calling me Pops and OG. Yeah. Indeed. And then I realized anybody like this like shit though in their face. Wow. You feel what I'm saying? All them years went by. And I left out in 1995. And if I have to pick change a Kotex machine or a baby, I'm not going back to prison. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not going back to prison. No, I understand that. Man, you know, I, that. I just I, I, I realized I can't even not, you know, the situation, but another juice would literally kill me. Yes, sir. Literally not the I can handle the situation. I mean, but you know what? Going back in another Basically, case, I'm not if we that. talk about fairness, yeah. if you caught another case, they ought to just chalk that up. They, they, I said, I thought about it a million times. <laughs> I said, I don't know why. Literally. And I said, Give me time, sir. Everything that happened to me is literally your fucking fault. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the system fault. Whenever yeah. I become in life, Literally, it's your fault, but I'm not going to give them that much leverage in my life. I, I need to take that back. No, I think God was saying it, and I need yeah. to take that fucking shit I, back. I think, I think God, because you still you harnessing that power. Man, you 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 doing what's back. supposed to be done, and yeah. and and man, kudos to you, man, and those other three, those other two guys, man. Like I said, man. But to keep that fight alive, we got to yes. keep that fight alive. Before I get you off here, though, Indeed. me and you talked last time. You mm-hmm. you, you was going to start your podcast. Yes, How's that coming? What's Man. the name of it? Indeed. How can people find it? Streets to the Pen. I say that was me and my guy that you just seen, Buff, Mr. Big Edward Buff. Humphrey. Yeah, so me and him going to be tag teaming that thing just like he was in the pen. You know what I'm saying? So it's from the streets to the pen. We're going to keep it moving. I say, hey, Angola Social Studies, bro. That's right. And go to social studies. We're going to deliver, period. We cutting out the middle, man. Anything dealing with this podcast, like I said before, is going to be consistent. Dealing with guys that was formerly incarcerated. That's going to inform you on things about law. Literally, they're not going to give it to you in the form where you sitting in class. We're going to actually, if your conviction is final, explain to me what happened, how you got convicted, and how you made it back. And Kind of navigate and break down these charges in a language that the people could understand it. That's right. You ain't always talking over the head. That's you right. You see what I'm saying? Because you go to talking all professional, but you doing that for who? The white folks understand it, but your people don't understand it, so they missing it. You impressing them that you got this shit all Eloquent together. Speech. Yeah, you want to stand in front of them and talk in all the wrong places with all this legal information. Mm-hmm. That should need to be in school, literally. Period. If you're gonna charge us for every month, because they keep coming at us in life, you might as well teach us all the fucking rules that you have. They right. now they tell you go to the public library. 
Oh, you need you. Oh, you. That's on you. You supposed to know, and they gonna hold you accountable for not knowing your constitution. That's right. Wow, man, Kunta, thank you for coming on the show, yeah. man. As always, Anytime. man, it's a pleasure, man. OG Piru, we down here in New Orleans. We met. I, I was able to link you up with Kunta. Kunta, you know what I'm saying? That's the that, show. Hey, listen, man. I love it, man. Yes, I, I love it. I, I know that's what God put me in this place for to bring brothers together like keep y'all, man, up. and keep on pushing for our our people to see. Hey, man, if you went through what you went through come on man we got some people that don't need to be complaining bro oh, you know what i'm saying no, it, it, this man never went through the fire you know what i'm I saying sure, sure. for I something he that. didn't even commit i want to say this last ball this is one thing that helped me make it through the prison system so if anybody that's in prison and you'd like to read literature i say the book geronimo pratt hmm. the last man standing flyest guy i ever read on in my life I was in prison with Geronimo. Fly, man, fly was, his guy yeah. hands down to be under that much heat and to still deliver to his people, go inside that prison, have the type of hits from the CIA, from the FBI, and everybody trying to eliminate. Guy went inside the prison and became so pivotal that that guy was teaching skinheads. Skin, I'm talking about skinheads. Look to Geronimo Pratt, and he was the teacher. Literally, he taught classes full of skinheads. Charles Manson said that's the only black man that he respected, and literally told him that. Bro, you, you the only black man I respect. Charles Manson taught me how to play backgammon in 1974. Wow. Yeah. 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 yeah, San Quentin, California. That's Charlie. crazy, man. Charlie, knew the, Charlie was a Trump. He knew the value of black people. Wow. That's, that's, yeah. Man, thank y'all, man. I hate to end this, man. I enjoyed this so much, man. It's been another great segment, man. Thank you, Kunta. We love you. Thank you, OG Pyru. I told them all we love you, bro. That's right. Man, the people love y'all, man. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101 while the bosses talk. The bosses talk. Man.